I'm Andre Breslov. I work on Kotlin at JetBrains. And today I'll be speaking about coroutines. And for a change, it's a language design talk. I hear those have gone out of fashion a while ago, but we can probably enjoy one anyway. So this talk could have been named uh, async awaiting yield, for example. Or <laughs> we could say it's about fibers. Or well, if, if you're squint enough. Uh, uh, or uh, we could say it's about continuations. And the thing is that all these things are more or less expressible to one another. And uh, the essence of all this is that we're talking about suspendable computations. So something we can stop where we want and then continue. I'll try to give some motivation, then show how other people do it, how we do it, and then we may dive deeper into byte codes and exception handling and stuff if we have enough time. Uh, so my mocking of the legal slide is that uh, I'm trying not to lie, but this hasn't been released yet. So uh, all I'm saying is uh, not less and not more final than Valhalla stuff. OK, so let's have a look at this piece of code. Is there anything wrong with it? Anything bad about this code? Uh, what? Oh, uh, right. <laughs> That's an option, too. Yeah, so uh, I don't know, actually, if it's bad or not. Uh, but if I add this, uh, load image from a URL as a time-consuming operation, and everything happens on the UI thread, uh, it's probably not so great because those guys kick in. And I'm a grumpy user frustrated looking at this. So <laughs> basically, this is why uh, people want asynchronous computations. And of course, it's not only about UI, although those guys appear on the, uh, only in the UI. So basically, uh, we all want latency, and blocking is bad. Uh, and one way of uh, mitigating this is saying that, OK, this piece of code is somehow special. It's a suspendable computation. I have my load image, my uh, time-consuming operation, <coughs> working somewhere else. And here, I'm awaiting on it, which means that when I get to the await point, this is a suspending call, I suspend, which means I don't block the thread anymore. So I hand off the work to the other thread. I'm not working here anymore. The UI thread may crunch on the events. And when the time consuming operation is done, somebody will schedule me back on the event queue, and I'll process the rest <coughs> of the code there is uh, a continuation. So basically, every suspending call slices the code block into at least two parts. And the continuation is scheduled back uh, when the time consuming part is done. Uh, any questions at this point? OK, I'll, I'll be trying to encourage questions because this keeps people alive. <clears throat> uh, there are different ways of doing this. And this is a screenshot from uh, a JavaScript program that you know how to read because all you care about is this. <laughs> uh, so one way of doing asynchronous <laughs> computations is for having callbacks. And when you want to. Uh, have one async op operation after another, after another, after another. Those callbacks nest into one another, and you get those letters of curly, 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 curly. So that's dubbed callback hell, and uh, that's what you have if you uh, use explicit callbacks. <laughs> An alternative to this will be futures and uh, doing all those nice functional combinators on futures, which is great. Uh, especially if uh, your complexity is not over the top. Uh, and if you don't want much control flow inside. Uh, but in practice, many people find it very, very functional, very advanced, uses a lot of type inference. Uh, and uh, many people would prefer straightforward control flow that's just suspending where you wanted to uh, wait on something else. <laughs> so this is the motivation. We, we want straightforward code that works asynchronously without disturbing the user very much. Uh, 
one constraint that we have is uh, minimizing runtime support, because uh, there are ways of doing uh, even more than, than we can do <laughs> uh, with the significant work on the runtime side. Uh, and uh, we wanted to, to avoid that. I managed to minimize our implementation so that in the library, we have only one thing, one interface of two methods, that's continuation, and that's it. So all the rest is compiler magic. Maybe we'll add one or two methods here and maybe one more class to speed things up, speed things up but that's it. So <laughs> as far as goals go, we want asynchronous programming supported in a, <laughs> in a nice way without explicit callbacks, without uh, involved feature combinators, and we want maximum flexibility, which means uh, we give the library writer as much power, as much um, freedom as possible, with minimal runtime support, and no, we don't have macros. So we have to somehow uh, devise something in the language uh, that's flexible enough. So a note on <laughs> what sort of core teams we're talking about. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's an option we can discuss. Um, mm, yeah. Okay, so, so, so far in, in our... Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so, so far our current prototype uses this, but maybe with Eric's feedback we uh, change things a lot. Uh, okay, so uh, important note. What we're doing here uh, is stackless coroutines. An alternative would be stackful, which are a lot nicer from the user's point of view, because you can suspend anywhere, uh, three calls down the stack, you can still suspend. And uh, in the stackless, uh, stackless case, uh, you only can do it inside the async block. So <laughs> we have inlining, so you can also do it in, uh, in inline lambda. But still, um, and this is uh, motivated for us and probably for, for many other people, Scala and C Sharp and many other people do it this way, uh, by the locality of the thing. Uh, to do stackful, uh, you have to transform c code all over the program, and uh, you, you need some substantial runtime support. Okay, any questions at this point? All right, so here's a piece of C Sharp. Uh, so C Sharp pioneered this uh, a few years ago, and this is how you do <laughs> async await. In C Sharp, I have two async functions. One is simply doing some work, actually wasting time for uh, 200 milliseconds and then saying done. Uh, and the other does some more work, prints something, then awaits on the first one, gets the result, and uh, writes it uh, to the console. So <laughs> what I want to emphasize here uh, uh, are these things, which are inflexibilities of this code. So the C-sharp solution uh, says, okay, we have two keywords in the language, async and await. And <laughs> whenever you are async, you have to return some sort of task, or either a task of something or just a task. Or you can return void. So this means that uh, as a library writer, I'm bound to uh, using task, which is probably changing in the upcoming version of, versions of C Sharp. And I'm definitely bound to using async and await, even if what I'm trying to express is not actually an asynchronous computation, but something that uses the, the underlying machinery for something else. Uh, so in Kotlin, we tried to go away from this and <laughs> uh, make it more flexible. So what we get uh, is something like this. Uh, so my word function returns a completable future, which is uh, just a decision for this particular library. So my async on the right is actually a function that returns com completable future. I have different kinds of async functions for different sorts of futures and other uh, synchronous APIs. So <laughs> my completable future uh, goes away by type inference. And um, so syntactically, all I did is moved async from the left to the right. But uh, the important part about this is that all those are points of flexibility. Async is a library function. I could have called it foo. And await is also a library function. I, and I could have had uh, different overloads of that, <clears throat> like with different names and different semantics. Like I could have an, an await that awaits on many things, for example, and stuff like that. 
Um, so that's what it looks like from the user <laughs> point of view, and let's look at how the library is written. Uh, let's st start with await. I have my continuation, and that's the biggest uh, interesting part of all this. So <laughs> when I declare await, I have to annotate it with suspend so that the compiler knows that this is a suspension point, and uh, when it looks at the uh, curly braces, the, the lambda passed to, to the async, it knows where to slice it into uh, different pieces. So my await is a special kind of function, and uh, it has two parameters. Complete loop future, which is work, right? I'm just passing it uh, inside here. And the second parameter is not mentioned in the code. It's passed in explicitly. It's a continuation. <laughs> so that when my future is done, I can uh, reschedule the rest of the computation uh, where I like. So, uh, and how we implement it, setting the exception handling aside, basically, I say completable future when complete, I get a value, the result, that done thing from the uh, work function, and I say continuation.resume of that value. <coughs> so this means that I continue from where I, start, uh, where, where I suspended, uh, and that code expects the result of the await function. So this value that I'm passing in here just uh, works as the, um, as the value uh, await evaluates to, and is written to the string variable and then printed. Questions here? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, and uh, a wait function itself returns units, so it doesn't return anything interesting. The actual return for the computation is done through the continuation. More questions? Yes, yes. So there are, uh, I'll show the, the rest of the bits, but the thing is that um, the compiler knows that uh, the lambda after a sync is the special coroutine lambda. So it spots the uh, suspend functions, uh, function calls inside that lambda and uh, transforms the code so that it <laughs> can suspend and uh, wraps it into continuations, so, so on and so forth. I, I'll show the de details later. More questions? Uh, exactly, yeah. And your await doesn't somehow say that my friend is in the sync. Uh, no, no, it doesn't uh, explicitly. I'll, I'll show you how the, the two are connected, okay. but it might not even mention that explicitly. Yeah. Do you consider the continuation single shot or can you draw the multiple lambda? Uh, it's single shot, uh, and th there are some subtleties about that that I'm not presenting today, but yeah, it's single shot. Okay. Let's now look at how async works. <coughs> async uh, is, again, a function, a special function because the compiler needs to know that the lambda we pass in is, uh, has to be transformed. So <coughs> I say that it's a coroutine parameter. And then this may be the most involved part of this talk because there, there, there is a scary type uh, for the C. And actually, it's a normal Kotlin type but not everybody's familiar with Kotlin. It's a function type and uh, actually an extension function type. So the first bit, future controller, is an implicit receiver for, for the lambda. It's like uh, if you're declaring an extension function, you have the implicit receiver that works as this inside the function. Same here. So future controller works as this inside the lambda. Await is actually the method of this controller. So you can call await without qualification because uh, this is implicit. Then the lambda may have parameters. Uh, in this case, it doesn't. And we don't actually know very many use cases for that, but for generality, we still support it. <laughs> and then this function uh, returns a continuation, which is kind of a funny uh, kind of continuation because it doesn't continue anything. It actually starts the computation. So it's the first uh, chunk of code before uh, the first suspension. It's a way to start the computation. So in the body of async, we simply create an instance of a controller. We initialize the, um, this coroutine with the controller instance, and then resume. So basically, we uh, execute this code. And the whole point of, of this async is to return a completable future. So uh, the controller 
has the future instance inside it. I'll, I'll show you a controller in the next slide and we return that. Questions here? So the job of async is to uh, take this lambda that's transformed to be suspendable, <laughs> initialize it, uh, start the computation, and return whatever usable instance there is, completable com completed future in this case. Questions? Yeah. It's a design choice. Here, uh, we do it synchronously. We could have done it on a different thread or anyhow else. So here, is, it's a lot of flexibility. I have my library code by fingertips. More questions? OK. Now the controller. Can you see the code? Hopefully, well, I can actually zoom in, so I shouldn't have asked. Um, <laughs> the controller is a class. Uh, first, it, it allocates a new completable feature instance. That needs, to, uh, that needs to communicate to the uh, end user. Then it has a weight that we've talked about already. And it has two handler functions. One is handle result, which is called every time the Lambda tries to return something, like for, for the work function, there is a string that we evaluate to. So uh, upon uh, completion of that <coughs> computation, handle result is called with this done constant, and uh, what it do does inside is uh, future.complete. So that's the result for, for uh, the computation. Questions here? OK. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so there is a second parameter, which has a funny type continuation of nothing. Nothing is an empty type, which means that uh, you cannot call uh, continuation.resume here, because there is no possible argument you can pass to it. But it can still continue with exception. So you can fail at this point, at least. And maybe we'll uh, extend the continuation interface a little further and see. <laughs> see about that. Um, more questions? <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah, I was about to uh, tell you about that anyway. So the, uh, the last method here is handling exceptions. So if there is any exception that tries to cross the uh, coroutine boundary, it will be handled by uh, this method here. I'll get into details a little further. The last thing is that uh, we have an annotation here. I'm not sure if it will stay an annotation or be a modifier. Uh, it says that this controller allows suspend extensions, which means that, uh, so normally, <coughs> by default, all the suspending functions await, await many, so on and so forth, have to be <laughs> members of the controller. So that the library author has full control on what the actual core team will suspend on. But, uh, if I don't have anything to hide, I can declare this controller as open as allow suspend extensions. And then I can add, so I as, a, as an end user or a, a second library can add more uh, suspend functions to that controller. So that's answering uh, your previous question. So <laughs> I can have outside the controller, I can have a suspend, uh, suspend function that is an extension to controller call it a wait again, but uh, have it work on not on a com completable future, but on a listenable future from Guava, for example. And whatever co code there is, the logic is the same. So I either assume um, normally or with exception. And <laughs> in the same async block, I can now use uh, both completable futures and listenable futures. So it <laughs> allows me to compose different kinds of futures in the same async. Questions here? All right. Uh, yeah, I was about to walk you through, but forgot, forgot about that. Um, so, summary on the library part. <coughs> uh, all we need to create a library that implements async is declare the coroutine builder async function with the coroutine parameter. Uh, basically, that's it. So, uh, all the other parameters may be arbitrary, do anything you like. Uh, you have to have one coroutine parameter to be a coroutine builder. Uh, then, we declare suspend functions normally inside, inside a controller, but maybe not. And the continuation is implicitly passed inside this function. And the controller class can um, handle all the intermediate state there is, and uh, it's a scope declaring uh, the suspension functions and uh, handlers for uh, return values and exceptions. Questions? OK, the question is, uh, there are those uh, handle result and, oh, sorry, 
handle result and uh, handle exception. Uh, how are they called? So basically, uh, when the compiler sees a coroutine, <laughs> uh, it looks for return points. And uh, at every return point, there is a call to handle result injected. And uh, handle exception, I'll show you later. OK. More questions here? All right. We've seen async. Let's look at yield. And uh, this time, we'll, uh, we'll be looking not at the library implementation, but at how it's compiled. So this is a piece of C sharp. And again, there are inflexibilities here. And C sharp, uh, a yielding function, a generator function, has to return i enumerable. And it uses keyword yield return uh, to actually yield a value. So add a new <laughs> bit. So the whole thing here computes a lazy infinite sequence of Fibonacci numbers. Uh, if you find a bug, please keep it to yourself. <laughs> OK, so, so this is like an infinite list. And uh, here is the same thing in Kotlin. So in Kotlin, we have sequences for uh, lazy things and iterables for uh, eager things. So here, it will be a sequence. I have generate as my function, uh, the, the scoping function for a coroutine. And <coughs> my yield is just a function. I can uh, also have yield all, for example, next to yield. And uh, it will take another sequence and uh, yield every element of it. So it should be more or less straightforward how we write this library. Here is a, a piece of code. So my generate has the same structure, creates a sequence object with an iterator with some sort of a controller. I'm not going into details of how the controller works. And the yield is a method of the controller. That's it. Questions here? All right, so um, a question to the audience. Why this continuation takes a unit here? It's just just to wake up a little. Bit. Yeah, you, you know that, but it's not interesting. So that's because yield doesn't return anything. So this this thing is the return type uh, that the coroutine gets from yield, and since it doesn't return anything interesting, it's unit. That's it. So we we're not. <laughs> uh, uh, we're not using yield as an expression. It's a statement. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't return anything interesting. Yeah, yeah. We, we could do a more involved thing, but we don't. Uh, how, how would what? Yeah, every async returns a different value. So we, we just, uh, for, uh, I will not scroll the slides back, but uh, the idea is that here yield uh, uses the type parameter of the class, but it could have uh, declared its own type parameter. Yeah, that would type. OK, uh, so all this is compiled through a standard technique to, uh, to state machines. So the idea is that we have suspension points here. My yield one and yield next are suspension points. And I have to be able to stop somewhere, wrap the rest into a continuation, <laughs> and then continue. Uh, so the way it's done, uh, we basically say that there is an initial state, L0, and then every uh, suspension point uh, generates a new state in the state machine. And uh, we just uh, remember the current state. And uh, when we continue, we jump to that state and continue from, from, from there. That's it. So here, here we have the initialization. Then the, the trivial edge between uh, L1 and L2 just checks for true. Actually, it's empty in the bytecode. Uh, and then uh, this loop edge does the work, actually, every time. And every state yields something, uh, apart from the initial one. So all this, so I'll, I'll go outside in. So all this um, machinery is compiled into a, an anonymous class, obviously, for, for this coroutine lambda. Uh, we're trying to economize in the number of objects allocated here. So this uh, same class works as a lambda itself and as a continuation. So we only have one instance for everything. And that's why we have uh, to implement function one here and continuation as well. <laughs> uh, it has the controller instance. The label is the current state of the state machine. Uh, we have our fields for local variables. So current, next, here, 
have to be stored in the um, in between the uh, uh, <laughs> operational uh, lifetimes of the coroutine. Then we have invoke. This is for the lambda. I'll uh, skip it. And resume and resume with extension uh, with the exception are the uh, continuation methods, and they are both implemented through this do resume method that actually contains the state machine. So well, now zoom into that one. Uh, any questions here? Anybody cares about those volatile things here? Okay, I'll get back to them maybe later. Okay. So now the do resume method. Okay. What's that? Uh, no, no, uh, vo volatile is always there. We actually don't need so many of them. Only one would be all right. But uh, we need some to uh, account for the um, multi-threaded cases because it wouldn't, wouldn't synchronize the state otherwise. OK. So when I, uh, so uh, what my do resume looks like, I have my label field that c contains the current state. <laughs> and do resume is basically, it, it starts with a switch uh, on the state that basically jumps uh, into some position in the code. So it's basically the original code of the untransformed lambda, where we inserted a bunch of uh, labels and a bunch of returns. That's about it. Um, so my L0 corresponds to the, the first branch, then L1 for the second, so on and so forth. And each, <laughs> um, each label ends with uh, assigning the new state and doing a yield. So this is a suspension. So this is how, how suspension works. We call uh, the suspending function and return. That's it. So we return the control to the whoever called us, the for loop most likely for, for this case. Questions here? Yep. So uh, do you have any restrictions to where it can let you uh, do um, joins, like where you need to find these blocks? Uh, we have some restrictions. We, we haven't implemented, but, but will implement uh, awaiting in finally blocks. And uh, some other cases are prohibited. Yep. Uh, yes. And that's the point. Because uh, if there is an exception from yield, I either uh, terminate the whole thing and it's invalidated altogether, or I handle it because there might have been a try catch, a user try catch around this, and then it's okay. Well, if if we uh, if we handle this, we'll continue in the code and reach another label assignment before we suspend again. Okay. Uh, now, <laughs> now let's have a look at how we start. So to start, I initialize my local variables. This is a chunk from, from the original code. Then I have nothing else to do. So I just copy those values uh, to the fields, assign the state, and make a suspension call. That's the trivial part. Yeah, so, so this is user code. The rest is bookkeeping. So here I just remember whatever I have on uh, my stack frame and uh, do the suspension magic. Uh, next, from L1 to L2, <laughs> I have to first restore the state onto the stack. Then maybe I have been resumed with the exception. So if there is an exception, I throw it. And whatever try catch I am surrounded with will, will handle that, or it will just be thrown upwards. <laughs> then again, I have nothing much to do because it's while true in between me and the next thing. So I just save the state back. Uh, into the fields and make a suspension call. That's how it works. It's pretty straightforward. Any questions here? No, it's uh, actually we, we optimize that. Only shared uh, the variables that are shared between states are um, copied uh, into the fields. Other, others are just very local, so we don't care about them. Uh, yeah, we, we do nullify those. Don't like memory leaks that much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, so that's it, basically. To summarize, 
uh, first note that we can express generating yield as well as async await. So it's not a single use case feature, it's at least a double use case feature. Uh, um, and then, so takeaway is a coroutine body is uh, compiled to a state machine. <laughs> and uh, there's only one instance allocated per the whole thing. Um, okay. Now the, sec the next thing is exception handling. So <laughs> let's think where exceptions can come from in this picture. So first thing, of course an exception can happen in my workload. So IO exception may happen when I, I'm reading from somewhere. Then a wait can throw, like a yield can throw. So a library code can throw something. So this one is asynchronous. It happens when I'm not on the stack, actually. <laughs> this one is synchronous, but it comes from library code. This one is still synchronous when set image, something I'm just genuinely calling, um, has thrown. I have to handle that as well. <laughs> so there are uh, different sources of exceptions. Library code can throw synchronously. Uh, Quoting code can throw synchronously. And uh, uh, the workload can throw asynchronously. And then <laughs> there are at least two parties that can catch. Coroutine can have its own try catch written by the user inside. Uh, so there, some exceptions can be caught. And library code can handle whatever it likes, uh, if it can. So I'll start with how library code does that. I mentioned that before. So <laughs> I lied a little bit on the previous slide because my do resume function is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the whole body. Uh, of the method, all the labels are wrapped in one big try catch that says if anything happens <laughs> inside those labels and is not handled there, uh, it's caught and passed on to the controller. So controller handles all the exceptions, including out of memory error, unfortunately, uh, that, have, that try to cross the, the boundary of the core team. So anything is passed to the controller, and then we, we can rethrow, we can do anything, we can try to uh, reset, resume, whatever. <laughs> so that's, that's how library uh, handles things. Uh, a little more details on that uh, thing I showed a few slides ago, uh, how we re reroute asynchronous exceptions. So if something happened in my asynchronous computation, uh, in the case of com completable future, I'll get uh, notified about it, so my when complete has the exception parameter here, and uh, if that is not null, I say resume with exception, which passes the value here, and every time I resume from anything, first thing I do after uh, restoring my stack it is uh, if there is an exception, I throw it. Maybe there is no handler inside the coroutine, and it will cross the boundary and go to the controller. Maybe there is a try catch around, and it will handle it. Questions here? <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what? Uh, we, if if a uh, oh yes, sure. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So let's have a look at this example. I have my async UI. It's the first example I was showing on the motivation slides. And <laughs> there are those marks where something can, can go wrong. So the actual operation order here is I first uh, call load image synchronously for it to give me a future back. Uh, simultaneously, it starts some actual work on the separate thread. So my first operation is load image. That may fail synchronously, and that will be handled by this try catch. Then uh, some actual work is going on, and I do a wait synchronously. So I'm trying to suspend. If a wait is not happy, it throws. It uh, throws synchronously again. It will be handled right away with the strike catch. <laughs> and uh, as we discussed with Remy, uh, if the, there wasn't a throw here, it could fall through here, and it's all right. That's how I wrote my program. Uh, then. So after I await, I suspend, I, I get shelved somewhere. My actual work completes and schedules me back. So that may have completed with an exception. So it will say, resume with exception, pass it in. 
uh, first thing I do after I resume, I throw that exception. I catch it again with this same try catch, <laughs> log and throw, and it's all right. So and the last thing that happens is this synchronous call here. If it throws, it just goes to the controller. Questions? Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it does compile because there is throw e here. Uh, no, it, it shouldn't. Yeah. More questions? Yeah, it's invalidated. We're thinking about the possibilities of uh, like resetting a coroutine. So that it may be not like dead, but its current state is dead. <laughs> More questions? All right. So somewhere here, uh, so we wanted a uniform tre treatment of all exceptions, synchronous and asynchronous, uh, by both user code and library. Kind of achieved, I think. Uh, the default handler by the library is controller handle exception if it's there. If it's not there, nothing happens and it's just thrown up the stack. Uh, so what I've not covered in this talk, I should have because I'm talking very fast and, and the questions don't take very much time, uh, is finally. So finally is a pain in the neck everywhere. So one thing is when, uh, so w when you suspend in a finally block, what happens then? Uh, you, may, you may have a stack of finally blocks actually uh, on top of your head. And if you suspend there, it means that there might have been an exception that you can have to rethrow. You have to uh, maintain this uh, information about what finally blocks you have to complete after you handle the exception. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty messy. It can't be done. Uh, we'll do it. Uh, not prototype yet. So that's one thing. Another thing is uh, how the library can interact with whatever finally blocks you, you, you have in your coroutine. Uh, because, so the problem there is that uh, I could have used my yield to read uh, a lazy sequence uh, from a file, for example. And that file has to be closed uh, when I uh, completed the iteration or when my for loop that iterates has thrown an exception. To support this, I need a, an extra method on the continuation or something else <laughs> that says, okay, uh, something bad happened, execute all the finally blocks. And that's another messy part of the transformation. Uh, on, on one hand, on the other hand, uh, Java and Kotlin don't have the <laughs> notion of <laughs> disposable iterator. So the semantics of the for loop uh, in Kotlin as well as in Java is that you just iterate when, until you hit the end. Uh, the semantics of uh, for loop in C sharp, for example, is that you iterate until you hit the end, but around you there is a try finally that uh, in the finally block checks if the iterator is disposable and disposes it, whatever happens, which is great. And we're thinking of whether we can actually <laughs> retrofit this feature in Kotlin 1.1 uh, somehow. It will work. It will be a little brittle with the old code, with the Java code, but it may be worth it. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, so... This has been the bulk of my talk, talk, but I have an appendix about like dreaming about uh, very distant and weird applications. Let's try to read through this. So I have a fictional function serializable async, which is running on a server. And what I do in this block is I show the user a registration form. So uh, yeah, show a registration form. You type in your username and password. Uh, I send you a confirmation email. You go have a tea. And when you return, you click on the link in the email. Uh, I receive that. I resume. I confirm your registration and show a welcome stream. Or <laughs> if you <laughs> never come back, the tea is too tasty. Uh, <laughs> I cancel. So the thing is, this is what we do on the server side all the time. Uh, all sorts of asynchronous uh, communication with the user. Uh, but, of course, I'm not anywhere in memory even, not only on the stack, I'm not in memory when you're drinking tea, right? So to, uh, to do this, <laughs> uh, 
to be able to suspend uh, uh, on all of those calls and basically put that into the database until you return, I have to serialize a lot of data. Well, here it's not a huge lot. I, I need to serialize the label and uh, the new user information. But <laughs> in general, it may be <coughs> in general it may be a lot of state to serialize. And uh, it's an open question for us whether we should or shouldn't do it because uh, everybody knows how tough serialization is um, and how messy. But it's very appealing because uh, we've seen lots of examples of such code. Uh, that can be simplified greatly. Because if you expand this at a, as a state machine, it won't be so bad. But if you make it a little more real, it's really bad. So this is a dream. We're thinking about it. To implement something like this, we'll need to, uh, some kind of reflection API on the coroutine state. Uh, and we have to somehow make it stable to, if you serialize a new version, uh, an old version, deserialize to a new version, uh, for it not to break very badly, at least. So we'll see. Uh, that's all.